I think our closing keynote speakers need very little by way of introduction to this group. We've all worked with them closely over the years. Ron Hamilton has been a psychometrician since he was a little boy. <laughs> that picture that we saw before, that was Ron, just getting started. He may tell you something different when he gets up here, but we all know how long it's been. It's his name that's on all of the assessment literature that we read and refer to, and it's Ron that we go to when we have a particularly naughty problem to solve. Something you may not know about Ron is that many years ago he had a particularly distinguished student by the name of Craig Mills, doctoral student. Craig went on to become a practitioner and has been responsible for some of the major breakthroughs that we've made in testing over the past few years. So today we're going to get both of their perspectives on where testing's going in the future. We welcome to the stage Ron Hamilton and Craig Mills. ATP, thank you for uh for the opportunity to, uh, to, to be here with, uh, with Craig. We've got a, uh, let me, uh, I, I think Mary said this, but uh, we were the uh, opening, I was here 12, 13 years ago and uh, gave the opening uh, uh, keynote address and Craig actually gave the uh, closing. So it's, it's a, a great thrill for us to be uh, to be uh, to be back and uh, see if we've learned anything. Uh, I spoke uh, 13 years ago about uh, this exciting topic of computer-based testing, and uh, that wasn't a very hard prediction. Uh, but uh, look what's happened. Uh, and item response theory uh, was still just getting going then. Uh, now it's almost taken for granted in in, in this group. And uh, Craig uh, followed up at the end of the day, at the end of the last day, and spoke about the future of credentialing, shared his vision, and then went out and did it with uh, AICPA, and we're going to hear a lot about that uh, today. Uh, as Mary said, I've been around a, a long time, and um, uh, 40, I, I, I started my graduate studies in 1966, so I've been around for 46 years, and in that period of time, uh, we've seen tremendous changes. I, I remember uh, it was basically multiple choice questioning in 1966. Uh, maybe we'd have some essays, but, and then now we've gone to really trying to make performance assessment work on a computer, and now we've got all this uh, assessment engineering technology which is gonna make it work. Uh, I was right there when we saw this transition. I remember so well. Jim Popham, uh, it was actually a Popham and Husick paper in 1969. And that was the paper that really got criterion reference testing going, which is the basis today for most of what we do in school testing and most of what we do in, in, in credentialing. I saw the transition of paper and pencil to computer administration. All of you are, are many of you are part of that now. Uh, Talk about fundamental changes. The NRT-CRT was huge, where we look at, at people in relation to knowledge, uh, bodies of content as opposed to in relation to one another. Uh, I don't know what's the most important change we've seen. Could it be the movement to technology? I, but, but this fundamental shift from uh, classical-based uh, testing models, I don't want to say to item response theory only, because I still am a strong advocate for classical test theory, and I think it has much to offer. But clearly, if you're going to make computer adaptive testing work and a lot of these new innovations, it's going to be IRT-based. Item banking requires, well, it, 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 it doesn't strictly require, but is absolutely helpful if we have IRT. Um, uh, those of you who have been following standard setting, I remember as one of the first books I read, uh, 1971, Bill Angoff introduced the Angoff method, or now everybody calls it modified Angoff, 
It was a footnote in a chapter he wrote on equating. And Ebel's method, which some of you uh, know from way back, was a part of a chapter of a textbook he wrote in 1972. And of course today, we've got, uh, we, you, you, I don't know where you start and end, but bookmark certainly is one of the more popular strategies today, IRT based by the way, and a whole array of, of new methods. Uh, some of you probably haven't had a chance yet to look at uh, Greg Sizek's uh, I, well, to call it a second edition really uh, is, is not right. It's a, it's a, it's a new book. Uh, lots of added authors. And I, I, I couldn't remember whether it was 500 or 600 pages when I wrote this slide. And it's small print, so people like me can hardly read it now. Uh, but but uh, this, this is going to be the book for the next 10 or 15 years. Um, and, and as I say, in 1971, you had contrasting groups, you had Ebel, you had Angoff, and that was it. Today, we've got 500 pages of, of a textbook. The, um, uh, and, and boy, boy, if there's one place I don't need to say test security, 20 years ago, what, what was it? Making sure that people didn't copy from one another or maybe steal some copies of the test? Uh, today, we're, I wasn't at that 7 o'clock this morning meeting, but uh, imagine uh, uh, we can't always trust our committee members. Uh, sometimes we worry about Federal Express who's delivering stuff. We certainly worry about our printers and the truck drivers. Uh, uh, the administrators have become a, a source of concern. Candidates themselves, and I could go on and on and on. Uh, so this, there's been a huge transition between what used to be and what is with respect to test security. And, and, and one of my favorite topics, although not maybe as important as security, but this movement from a, a, a fixed form of an assessment, which we all used in the late 60s and early 70s, and now we've got multi-stage test designs, we've got computer adaptive tests, and. Uh, on and on and on it goes. So, I mean, the, the changes that have taken place are, are just uh, remarkable, unlike my ch slide change here, which seems to be unremarkable. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, 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 this graph doesn't show it, but I, what I had in mind when I drew it, it was supposed to be a bit more exponential than it's here, I'm not that good with PowerPoint, but 1970, it was criterion reference testing in 84 with the publication of, of Lord's book in 80 and a few things later. Uh, we, we've seen a, a much wider acceptance of item response theory and, and, ap and more importantly, the applications. Uh, into the 90s and late 90s, we've seen this massive move to the computer of our tests, credentialing people in particular. Educational people are on the verge of, in the next two or three years, most of your kids, K through 12, are all going to be on the computer for all kinds of tests. Um, and today, my goodness, uh, this conference is such an eye-opener, even for somebody who kind of keeps an eye on these things. What's going on here with the new item types and the new technology and uh, security issues and so on, it's just unbelievable what's, what's happening. And this is an important point because we're going to come back to it uh, Back to it later. We put up uh, these four points, and, and we're going to talk about each of these in the next uh, little bit. Uh, tests administered anywhere, anytime. Uh, the fact these tests are going to be authentic or realistic. We need reliability. We need validity if we're going performance testing. Well, we always need it, but it's much more of an issue, I think, with these newer formats that we're less familiar with. Uh, we're going to have to do it in real time. It's going to have to be automated. We're going to need lots of new technology. We're going to need test security uh, around the world. 
And, uh, and, and sort of my favorite topic at, at these days is, is the score reports. It's actually less of an issue for credentialing, although as soon as you move into diagnostic testing, you got the same problems we've got on the education side. But uh, this is absolutely a huge understudy problem that Craig and I are going to talk a little bit about. Craig, my, uh, there we go. Um, so. Thank you. Uh, Craig, uh, we're, we're going to go through these four topics, and Craig will talk a little bit, uh, and, uh, and then I'll follow up with a couple of, of personal thoughts. Thanks, Rob. It's really a pleasure to be back in, in front of this group at ATP. I've been watching the, uh, the LinkedIn people saying, this has become the go-to conference for me. Uh, I don't get the, I'm not doing the kind of work that we see at AERA and CME. That certainly speaks for me as, as well, uh, and it's, it's just wonderful to see the growth of this organization and the strength of it, the work that it's doing. Before I uh, start talking about the topics that uh, Ron mentioned, I thought I'd talk about some, some larger trends that are going on out in the world, uh, because those are going to affect us more than the work that we do uh, ourselves. So one, the Internet and using the Internet to collaborate. This is a couple of kids working together on projects uh, in different continents. Kids are playing games uh, collaboratively where team members are in three or four different continents. Animated movies. Animated movies are being produced where the animators, the directors, the actors are never in the same room. It's all done over the Internet. Uh, just fascinating opportunities there. Well, there we go. Actually, it's time to get on the cloud. Business is moving to the, cl to the cloud. Sure, there are lots of security issues. We have to look at those. Uh, but let's look at what some organizations are saying. The London School of Economics and Political Science says it's going to spur economic growth. It's going to increase productivity and it's going to change the skills that people need. The Forrester firm, look at those numbers, 41 billion, 240 billion. Six times growth in the next decade is what is predicted for cloud computing. I don't know how many of you are familiar with population pyramids, but this is the population pyramid for India. The bottom row is the number of people in 2009 who were between zero and four years old in India over 120 million people. Now, how do we compare that? The Japanese total population is 127 million. The United States workforce, 155 million. If one in 10 Indians under the age of 20 gets a college degree, that's 40 to 60 million highly skilled, highly trained, relatively inexpensive people. That will affect what we do worldwide, and it will affect how we work with people here as well. We are educating today's youth to take jobs that do not exist today. People graduate from college, over half of what they learned the first year is obsolete. This is not multiple choice testing. This is not hand scoring. We need new paradigms that reflect the new competencies that are needed for success. We need to develop processes that maintain quality, validity, and that are responsive to the changes. So let's talk a little bit about performance testing. Oh, huge, huge number of sessions on performance testing this year. It's been plagued over time uh, by form over substance. Uh, people say, it's got to be real. It feels like the real thing. Now, I don't know how many of you got this, but Buck Chafee uh, sent me a note uh, with a nice ATP thing on it, and I don't know why he picked me out. Uh, but it was talking about one of the sessions that he was going to do. Did any of you get that email? I mean, I got like 20 or 30 emails about sessions, and I felt very pleased that I'd been picked out as somebody important enough to write this to. But Buck said, <laughs> Buck essentially said, People get seduced by the interface, and then they get left at the altar 
when it's time to process information. Now here I've seen some really good work. The Cisco people are doing some good work. Uh, Conexa had, had, has done some nice work, uh, Breakthrough and others, in changing what we're doing with performance testing and focusing on the information. So let me show you uh, a couple of things that we're doing at the AICPA. Uh, if you'd like, I'll give you five minutes to, to work this problem out. <laughs> but what you really need to know, this is about depreciation. A company has some depreciation. They're filling out a tax form. And the time period is 2008. 2008 is when the Stimulus Act was passed. They're contemplating another acquisition. And the task here is to help them understand the implications of they, if they do that acquisition in August of 2008 or they wait till 2009. So how does the candidate go about that? Oh, we lost it. You see, if you could read this, up at the top you would see a tab that says New Law. The candidate actually has to access the new law, find the depreciation stuff, and then do both calculations. There are lots of measurement opportunities here. Uh, we get, you know, eight or ten different scorable things out of it. But we've also been thinking about multiple choice questions. What can we do with that? So here is a multiple choice question that we have that is asking for a bank reconciliation. Uh, balancing the checkbook. The second paragraph here says the bank manager noted the checks were cleared on December 30th and then somewhere else it says uh, they went into the system on January 1st and there's a $20,000 discrepancy here. That, if you just note that second paragraph, you can know how to answer this question. However, if instead you get a little information and then you actually have to access the bank reconciliation letter and find the note at the bottom, uh, it's a different task. And it is the kind of task somebody does in their office every day. Doesn't take much longer, uh, and it's a more realistic, I'm sorry, I'm losing my, there we go, okay. Okay, so that's what we're doing in, in performance testing. We're going to do a lot more. Uh, Ron, I know you have some thoughts and concerns about uh, what's being done with performance testing. Thanks, Craig, for that. These guys are doing just terrific uh, work. Um, AICPA, uh, I, I, I said 1998, Craig, but I wasn't exactly sure. I know it was around that time. Uh, since that time, so you're 11 or 12 years into this. Uh, if you're looking for a, a, a really good model for how to go about the design of new item types and then the validation work and the scoring and all of that, and, and to their credit too, unlike a lot of the credentialing groups, uh, AICP has published a lot of their work. They've given symposia, and I think that's important. If you do good work, you need to get it out there for critical review, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that later. Uh, but for sure, you guys are getting awfully close to the look and feel of the job, and I think that's what a lot of us are, are trying to do. Uh, I, I, I continue to worry uh, uh, about aspects of a job that, that, uh, that can't be, or at least with current technology, uh, can't be um, uh, uh, placed within an assessment format, and so I think that's going to be the challenge is to address what might be called the construct under representation. It's the part of the job you want to assess, but with current technology, we can't. And I think if you're looking for something to study, I, I think, and I, when, as I look at some of these new item types that some of the smaller and larger companies are putting forward here, uh, show me we can do stuff we couldn't do before, or show me we can do better what we were doing before. But I, here I'm particularly interested in, in measuring things we couldn't measure before. I look at, at what's going on at the National Board of Medical Examiners with their clinical skills assessment. I look at what the architects have already done. I look at the military. There's some fabulous uh, simulation stuff being done by our military. And so, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that that we can do, but I think all of us need to do an awful lot more research so that we aren't being criticized when we go to court because we really haven't captured some of the key elements of the job. And I think that's what I like about Craig's efforts, Krista Breithoff and others. Uh, um, 
Uh, a couple more thoughts real quick. Um, um, related to this issue, uh, uh, automated, uh, automated, excuse me, automated item construction. Wow, I mean, I get really excited. I, I think of Rick Lick and his assessment engineering. Um, and of course, there's a lot of this work going on here. So I'm really optimistic. But you know, I want to see us start to mimic uh, some of these on-the-job experiences and do it in a way we can produce lots and lots of items. Because as we open up, I think these guys are, are running a program. I think eight months out of every 12, candidates can take a test. You've got to have an awful lot of good material. Uh, uh, because of the security issues and all of that other stuff. But, so this is a, a good topic. Uh, and, and for those of you who aren't working in the field of education, I gotta tell you, we're on the verge of massive ed reform. Um, and we're moving uh, most of the year-end tests, the high school graduation tests. Some states, it's already on the computer. Other states are, are going there right now. There's a tremendous amount of diagnostic testing already on the computer. Um, and so, so we're going to see some huge developments because all of your smaller as well as your larger companies are trying to figure out how to develop new item types that will get at the construct and that will be uh, something that we can automate it, uh, score in an automated way. So I'm just really excited about watching the big publishers especially, but the little ones too, they have more flexibility and all of that stuff. So I, it, it, this is going to be another very promising area for research. Craig, maybe just a couple other points. Uh, I, I love this Rick Lick quote, if wheels aren't turning, you're not making money. And, and what I'm thinking about here is that we ought, I, I wish we could be totally authentic and if we have to keep candidates eight hours or 20 hours on the exam, well, so be it, but it's costly. And we've got to be thinking um, not about all the wonderful things we can do, but how are we going to get score points per minute uh, we can't have them read a 15-page da-da-da-da-da and then ask them two questions for two points. That just isn't going to work. There have to be compromises between what we want to do and what we need to get. If we're not getting measurement points, we're not getting reliability, we're not getting validity, and we're going to end up in court. So you're going to have to demonstrate. So this compromise is going to be a good one. And I think when Craig and his group are playing with these kind, not playing, but uh, working on these kinds of things, I think it's, it's the trade-off between how much text do we need in background versus how can we maximize the amount of information and still make sure we're getting at that construct representation. So, and I, yeah, this is what I was trying to say, that if, if you don't get the reliabilities and validities up higher, um, uh, you're, you're in trouble. And the way you're going to do that is by, I think, compromising between the authenticity which you value uh, and, 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 um, um, and, 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 uh, and, and finding uh, good ways to get score points that we can then incorporate into these uh, scores that we need. Um, I, you know, I wander around here and, and I've seen some really, I, I, I apologize for using words like slick and, and glitzy, but some of it, that's how I feel. Um, but if it isn't going to enhance the measurement quality, what's, what's the bother? And, and I, I think, and I say this at the very end, we've got to ask much harder questions of these uh, commercial groups. Show us the evidence. Show us that we're enhancing reliability and we're enhancing validity. Maybe the c increasing cost is okay, uh, a little bit. Uh, but I think sometimes we're going to be paying for the glitz and paying for the slickness, spending more money and not doing one bit of good for the credentialing exams that we're responsible for. This is my concern. Uh, but I, I want to leave this point, Craig, on a, on a positive note, and, and, and that is that, that uh, there's clearly a new generation of item types coming along with a lot of potential, and I just hope the people who are doing that kind of work are going to remember there's got to be a research base to support, and we ought not to be buying stuff because it looks glitzy. We ought to buy stuff because there's evidence that it's going to enhance the reliability and validity, and protect my grandchildren who are coming along and, and uh, I, I want to be sure we're credentialing the right people. And uh, uh, that means we're going to have to have a trail of reliability and validity studies and other kinds of research 
to help us make the case. And, and I, if I were sitting in, in, in your seat uh, and, and I weren't a contractor, I would be asking really hard questions. Uh, I, I want to see validity evidence before I'm going to buy into boom, 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 boom. So let's all get on with it. Now, Craig, if you'll, uh, uh, let, this is not not quite what you were talking about. Uh, but I, 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 you know, this is a group that want, aspires to go international, right? You, you both heard it yesterday, and we've seen it. There's a great misconception out there about test translation. Notice I don't even use the, I did use translation, but adaptation is more of the important point. This is a lot harder to do than finding somebody who spent last summer in Paris and having them translate your questions. Uh, this is pretty serious business. And even the companies that I've seen, I think, come up a little bit short. They're good on the, the, uh, the literal translations and maybe other aspects, but this is a big field of study, and it's been out there for 50, uh, I'm sorry, for Oh, I would say since about 1990. I, a colleague of mine told me that I ought not to read any cross-cultural literature pre-1990. He said, because it's all useless, because the translations were so poor that you couldn't trust any of the reserves. Now, this was Ipa Porjinga, who at the time was probably the number one cross-cultural psychologist in the world. Uh, it's much more complicated and time-consuming and more expensive than you think. And it isn't just getting the judgmental reviews, oh, that looks and feels okay. There's a whole empirical element of this. Most of us, given the opportunity, we would never use a test question if we hadn't had a chance to field test it. And if we can't do pre-testing, we at least do field, we at least do item analysis on our operational test, and we'll pull items out or change the scoring if we have to. But there's got to be an empirical component to this. And now we're talking structural equation modeling, we're talking differential item functioning, and we're talking other kinds of methodologies. But you're not off the hook just because the translation company said, oh, it's okay. You're not. And you're going to get nailed by critics like me who come along and say, where's the empirical evidence that the items are doing what you say they're doing? And so we need to figure out, I mean, there's a lot of methodology already uh, but there are cultural aspects to this. Uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, really to, I learned a lot from, from uh, a, a bit of time with them uh, on doing this kind of thing. They were producing their tests for the Internet and for many, many, many languages. Uh, when they were going into German, what they found was, you know, they were doing pretty good translations. But the words were longer. And you know what happened? They ran into a speededness problem. They didn't adapt by changing the time limit. The longer words meant candidates needed more time, and there was a, 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 an invalidity caused by the extra speediness of the test. Now, eventually they changed it, but uh, there's cultural. We, I found out we were doing some work for national assessment and found out that Chinese kids didn't know anything about hamburgers and cash registers. Uh, it was a cultural thing, and, and uh, uh, there are psychological aspects to this, there's semantic issues, uh, linguistic stuff. It's a big, difficult area, and if you're going international, you need to be very, very serious about the kind of empirical evidence as well as the judgmental reviews that you need. Even, even how you pick translators. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Oh, uh, yeah, this is, okay, I shouldn't, uh, there's not many funny things in psychometrics, <laughs> right? I mean, it's hard to make anybody laugh, but uh, this will just highlight the point. Uh, out of sight, out of mind. Now, that's an expression we all know, and it was uh, uh, translated into, into French and then back translated, and uh, this is how it came back. <laughs> totally missed the point. Now, this is a, a good example of, of the dangers that are out there. Uh, uh, um, I, Craig, I'm going to skip this stuff. Uh, I, I, we'll leave them in the slides, and, and uh, uh, you can come. You, we'll give you the slides later. But there's a whole series of myths about uh, a good translation guarantees validity. Of course, it doesn't. Um, uh, judgmental reviews are enough. They are not. It's a huge mistake to squit after you've had your translators do their work. Um, another one would be, um, to remind myself, uh, people think 
do a back, you know, go from English to Spanish and back translate, then look at the original English and the back translated uh, English. Because I don't know Spanish, but I can look at a back translated version. That's not enough. Uh, and if you're going to do empirical data, oh, let's find some bilinguals. Well, the problem with bilinguals, they don't represent anybody. The, f the fact that they know both languages invalidates them as a source of evidence. And yet, that's your classic design. If you look, I can look, I can show you uh, 50 places where this is, oh, and we're doing the right thing because we're doing back translation and we're, oh, and we heard your point about, bi about empirical stuff. We'll do it with bilinguals. No, no, no. Craig. <laughs> So, Ron, I really wish you hadn't skipped those slides. Uh, if we're talking about real-time testing anywhere, anytime, we're talking about lots of test forms. And when I went to the AICPA, we wrote 300 questions a year. We had a form in May, and we had a form in the fall. Uh, I got there, I said, this will never do. So we doubled. We went to two forms in the spring and the fall, and people were really upset about the workload. But now, this is what we call a panel. We, we use multi-stage testing, or variant of it, and we have four stages. Three of them are multiple choice. We have two, uh, two, two levels of difficulty. So a person will take uh, one, two, three, four of the uh, six or seven available testlets. Every one of those boxes has operational questions and pretest questions. Every quarter, we put out at least 25 of these for each of four sections. So we're doing this 400 times a year. And the people who used to say, okay, for item one, I'm going to get a plan the engagement item, and for item two, I'm going to get this, and it never changed, that doesn't work. So from the work of Krista and, and others, we've implemented automated test assembly. And for a resource file, these are the information functions that we have for our moderate and difficult testlets. And you can see how close together they are. And again, we do this four times a year for four different sections. Uh, so we're doing about 400 panels a year. Now, that's just one approach to test assembly. I know Ron uh, has some thoughts about this and also some thoughts about other kinds of assembly. Thank you, Craig. And I, uh, we are running a bit behind, so I'm going to try to uh, do the impossible for me. Uh, and, and be um, the... Uh, Uh, there are other groups who've been doing some of this kind of work, but on the kind of scale that Craig's been talking about, it's, it's, it's my judgment, it's brilliant. Um, they went to uh, a kind of computer adaptive test. They adopted multi-stage design. Some of their research will explain why they did. Uh, they had some terrific uh, uh, consultants who were really into this, uh, Rick Lick and Wim van der Linden, and, and I think that they're on the cutting edge with respect to... Uh, to uh, uh, adaptive test. Uh, it does change the role for, um, for, um, for, for committees, but that's okay. Uh, but w basically with this automated test assembly, what, what they're doing is they, they've figured out, and this, this flows from a lot of work that was done in Holland under Wim van der Linden's direction, but figured out how to take the usual kind of specifications, content and statistics, and basically express them in terms of equations. And then you can, I think at ETS, for example, on some of their tests, they've got over 200 sets of specifications. You can control everything. Balance of artwork, um, um, number of questions per page, the distribution of keys, and on and on and on. Uh, you want to you, you select a passage and questions as opposed to question by question? That you can do. So they figure it out over more than 10 years of research. I think they started around 88. And so it was a wonderful laboratory AICPA to try a lot of this stuff out, but um, you solve the equations and um, out comes a solution. I mean, if you ask for, for something that's impossible, then you don't get a solution, but then you go back and you change your specs. Uh, if you put in, you want reliability 0.98 and validity 
seven, eight, and some ridiculous things like that, then you're not going to get a solution. But it, uh, the way I, I think of what this automated test assembly is, it's like I've got a big bank of items, and uh, I've got a binary on-off for every item. And some little person in the computer goes and pulls down some switches and moves from off to on, and that's our test. And then you work with your committees and in some cases uh, delete items because maybe you haven't control. It's, a lot of, it's a quite an interesting methodology. It's, it's really a merger of item response theory, computer technology, operations research, as well as a lot of test development expertise. And it, it doesn't really matter, uh, CVT, CAD, MST, all of those variations and hundreds more can all be represented within this uh, uh, ATA um, um, uh, machinery. I just want to, to, to point out, though, as much as I like multi-stage testing and I admire what AICPA has done, it, it's hard to find good theory. I mean, you can go back and read Fred Lord's um, research way back in the early 70s. There, there isn't theory. You do need a, an IRT model, and it sure better fit your data, but uh, after that, it's a lot of empirical work how many stages? Craig and his group went to what we used to call a one-two-two. Two. Uh, okay, uh, but why not a different design? Well, there's actually a good reason for that, but it may not be applicable to you. And, and uh, how many modules at a stage? How many items per module? What kind of distribution of items within a module do you want? What kind of variation of item difficulties? How do you balance the content? I mean, I could go on. Uh, here's a one-three-four. Okay, but there's uh, why that one and not a 133 or a 1333? My colleague at UMass is doing a lot of work with that old proficiency, and he's got actually a 444444. Four, 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 four. Well, they did two or three years of research and decided that that was a good design for them. So there's lots of research to be done here. It's a great design. Uh, ETS, I know, has moved to this, some version of this design for the GRE. I don't know how well that's known, but they've backed off the CAT and they're going to some version of, of multi-stage. So we'll find out eventually, but it's an operation now. Um, you got to retrain your committees. That's not really a researchy thing, but you got to make sure they feel uh, that, that they're important, and they obviously are, but their roles are different. And one more important point, and this is a kind of a pet peeve of mine, and, and that is that those of us sometimes who move into the IRT field, we hear it's a good thing, and it is, but you've got to be careful in the models that you choose. And you can't just say, oh, I'll use that one. Does it fit your data? If the model doesn't fit your data, then all this other stuff we're trying to do, the multi-stage designs or the CAT or uh, uh, reporting information functions, all of that is nonsense. So you don't just go and say, oh, I, uh, 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 what is it, IRT, uh, and what's the simplest model? Maybe it's this one or maybe it's that one. But you're not off the hook just because you're using IRT Pro, which I'm really excited about, um, but you're not off the hook. You've got to find a model that fits your data, and that's going to be more research. So, uh, Craig, uh, why don't we say a few words about security? Sure, I'd be happy to. So uh, I have to tell you, I did take this, this opportunity to talk with Ron uh, w with a little bit of trepidation because I'm concerned that he just never demonstrates his passion for these topics. <laughs> uh, so again, anytime testing, anywhere testing, you're building a lot of tests, you're going to lose a lot of tests. So this was in February 7th. Everybody re recognize this? There are cheating hearts all around the world, folks. This is a prosecutor in Korea talking about a, a school that they busted, stealing TOEIC questions and also tests from their national English proficiency test. Uh, the Caveon folks tell us all the time about technology, and in fact, that Korean uh, organization was recording audio and taking it out. But we have solutions for this. We sue. I don't know if you recognize Su Su Sumi Blues, uh, Blues from George Harrison. AICPA just got a settlement against a firm uh, here in the States. We got our lawyers. They got theirs. And we had a really bad time. But we did get a settlement. 
Uh, we're, we're very pleased, in fact, with uh, how that turned out. Uh, the GMAT folks have been very, very aggressive about addressing test security issues. They've had a number of notable successes. But I want you to think about whether or not we can afford to do it, keep doing it the way we're doing it. Can we take two years, on average, to develop a question and put it on a test? Can we spend $1,000 to $3,000 on every one of those questions? Can we have a process that relies on humans who can prove to us conclusively over and over again that given the same task twice, they won't give you the same result, and if you ignore their results and use questions whether they've approved them or not, you probably can't tell the difference in the statistics that you get out. Those, those reviews, they take a long time. They're very important. Don't get me wrong. I think we have to have them, but do we do them correctly? That kind of money, that timeline, and a test question is going to disappear in a week. Do we need different models? So, Ron. Thank you, uh, Craig. Um, I, I, I'm not the expert in, in this room. Uh, I, I think of Dave Foster, I think of Jim Olson, I think of many of you who have contributed to this line of research. But if, if there's one thing I've learned, in, and I've been in some, some of those cases, Craig, uh, one of the things I've learned is that, that uh, if we're going to attack this problem of, of test security, we have to go about it in a, a comprehensive way. Uh, um, and I, uh, uh, maybe that's obvious to people, and we, and we need to be relentless because people are so creative. Uh, we've got committee members taking items home and sharing them in some form or other, uh, handing them off to the coaching schools. Uh, uh, some of the uh, crooks you talked about, Craig, uh, are using CIA equipment. Remember we had a demonstration here one time with the miniature cameras, and he was walking around and he had the camera on his tie, and, and it was just amazing, uh, or at least for me, because I couldn't believe people would, would do stuff like that. They bring the little miniature cameras and snap all your questions, and there goes a couple of thousand every time they snap their uh, uh, miniature uh, speaker. People are coming in in sessions with the little miniature things in their ears and talking to the questions and getting the answers back, hiding their, to their phones in the toilets, and. Uh, uh, did you hear about the $10,000 pencil? Somebody stole uh, the key from one of the uh, SATs and made it up, put the scoring key on a pencil and was selling it in Los Angeles for $10,000 a pencil. Uh, debriefing of students is so common and then, and, and, you know, if tests are lousy anyway, uh, then you can cheat, right? I mean, that's sort of the argument. And uh, I was involved in a case in Canada which uh, where it was just devastating. Uh, and this had been going on for seven or eight years before it got spotted, but they were stealing questions. The coaching schools then was prepping the candidates, and there was a surprisingly high amount of repeat items. Not, not, not three years from now or six, but the next administration. And it was just devastating. Um, and, and, you know, one wonders about how many nurses that have been working on me uh, <laughs> or unqualified, or my wife, who's we've spent a lot of time in Canadian hospitals, and uh, one wonders, but it, it went on for eight years. Uh, we've done some of our own little work. Uh, this is an example of a time series thing that one of my students, Ning Hong, came up with, but we got a whole series. If I had more time, we could show you some of our efforts, but there's so many better efforts that are out there, and uh, um, uh, it's just we got to be relentless because at stake here is the validity, the the validity of what we're doing, and if we can't if we can't control this and stop this, then we may as well just go home and go to the beach or something because it's not worth producing tests if they're being stolen <laughs> left and right. So at the end of the day, if we can't provide useful information to our candidates, then we've been mis misunderstood. I remarked last night the first paper I ever wrote with Ron was on score reporting, and I've been trying to get it right ever since. Uh, let me show you the sequence that we've gone through at AICPA. When we first started, 
we were only able to, we, we thought we don't want people to overemphasize things. So we'll just tell them whether they were weak or strong. They hated it. So we got candidates together and we developed exactly what they wanted. They got to compare themselves to uh, people who were just passing. They got these nice little scores. Those scores were not related to their total score, but boy, they sure tried to make them. And so we had to go back to the drawing board. And now we have this, which seems to meet their information needs and we think is psych psychometrically justifiable. Uh, I know we're running really short on time, so I'll, uh, Ron, let you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, we, 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 Craig and I had an understanding, no matter what happens with time, we're going to hit this topic, because uh, it's my favorite, actually. Uh, and it's probably the most understudied problem in the field of assessment today. Um, AICPA, to its great credit, is doing it right. Uh, they had people come together, they did drafts. I think their second, that second version, which they did use operationally, they went out and, and did focus groups and learned from that, and they had encouragement of the field to provide input, and they made more changes, and now they're in version three. And I haven't actually heard any data, Craig, on that one, but I'm sure uh, you're feeling pretty comfortable now with where you are. Our, our measure of success is when the phones don't ring, we're happy. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, um, um, uh, there actually is more literature on this topic than you might think, and you want to go to the NCME website and look up publications, and there's a bibliography there that runs about 70 pages, and there's some some um, uh, write-ups on some of the articles anyway. Uh, I, I think uh, the credentialing people are in pretty good shape until they get into diagnostic score reporting and then they're a mess. Um, uh, or too many of them. Um, uh, failing to caution people about the unreliability of the information. Um, uh, failing to provide any real baseline so all you really can do is look for high and low scores and that's not very useful. Uh, so I think it was unreliability issues. We need baselines to help people uh, interpret. Uh, we need reference groups, perhaps, that could provide some of that. Um, so there's an awful lot more that can be done. Now, I'll just mention, uh, if you're on the educational research side or psych research side, we all know about experiments. You can do experiments. I want to do my report this way or that way. Do it both ways. Field test it and see what happens. Ask people to the, the questions you hope they can infer from that diagnostic report and see what happens. Uh, we've been shocked at, at uh, things that we liked and we later find out that nobody can understand. And, uh, but this would be a great topic for another day. Focus groups are obvious. Uh, Craig and his group did it uh, with great success. Think aloud, stand over somebody's shoulder and have them talk as they're, where do they start looking? Top left corner or in the middle or where? And what confuses them? And what silly things do they say or infer from what they're looking at? Uh, reviews from the field. Um, um, there's a lot of people. I, I actually think, uh, I, I don't know the credentialing nearly as well, but on the educational side, we've come a long way. I'm actually quite impressed now with what I see. But, but take a look at other, you, you, you know, you'd, you'd look for what others are doing in other ways. Look at their reports too and see what you can learn. But no matter what you think you've learned, get out there and, and, and uh, really trying out. So there's a lot of things. I'm not going to go through this, but uh, April Zaniski and I have been working on a model. And what's your purpose? Why are we doing this? Uh, who are we communicating with? Uh, take a look at what the competition is doing. Uh, put drafts together, get out there and try them out, and then go with them and then constantly revise. But I mean, so we have models, it's just nobody's using them. I shouldn't say nobody, but uh, not nearly enough. Craig, I, I, that's all I'm going to say on reporting. I, I really think you guys are on the right track, and I admire you for what you've been doing, and I'm happy that you're happy with, with, you. with your product. Well, I have the uh, uh, task of, of saying, uh, trying to wrap this up. Um, Craig and I have tried hard this morning to, to give you some ideas. Certainly AICPA is almost a model in my mind. I could give you some others that I really like, but um, AICPA in my mind is pretty much a model. Uh, we've both learned a lot at this conference, um, and I imagine you have lots of ideas, and certainly Craig and I have too. But with, with this talk this morning, we want to leave you with, with three thoughts. Uh, the first is so obvious, but I just 
felt remiss if we didn't say it. The, the field of credentialing is just brimming over with great ideas and important advances. The technology is a huge part of what you're doing and, and it's just exciting to see what's, what's happening. The second point is not so obvious and, and uh, it's something that Craig and I, I think Craig represents it and I just want to reinforce, but it's the fact we need research. The fact that you or I think something looks right or probably is right, that's not evidence really might be evidence to go to the next step, but um, we've got to see. The, the thing that, that I marvel at with respect to AICPA, and I could give a couple of other organizations too, but that's not our agenda this morning. Uh, most, maybe all, uh, that they've done has been based on research studies. I can send you, you know, you can go and see Rick Lick stuff and, and, um, and uh, Wim van der Linden stuff and Krista Breithoff and I could give you a whole, I could probably list 15 people who have published papers um, in the professional journals with, with uh, the usual kinds of peer reviews. That's pretty impressive. And it was on the basis of the good research that a lot of the changes were made. It wasn't change for change's sake or change because it felt good or right. It was change because there was research evidence to support. I never would have said, in fact, I probably said go with a 133 design. They went with a 122. But it was based on a lot of research. And in fact, I think that really, and I, I think other good examples, I think the clinical assessment uh, piece that the, uh, the National Board is doing, National Board of Medical Examiners. Uh, our, the architect's exam is another classic where there was research all the way on the scoring, on the displays, and there's other organizations obviously too. So I think the, the second big point of our, of our presentation is do research, make decisions based on research findings. And, and the third thing, and it's a kind of endorsement, really, of, of what is happening here, but you know what? Our field is, is going up exponentially. Uh, nobody can be an expert on everything that, that we need. We haven't even touched on standard setting. We, we, we could take three days here to bring you up to date with all the exciting things on standard setting, and that's just one example, and we didn't even talk about it. So I, I think that, uh, that, uh, that um, ATP has got to be even more active, in my judgment, on running workshops. You know what? I probably would have two days of workshops and then one day of everything else. Uh, people need to know about item response theory, generalizability theory, standard setting, item banking, automated test assembly, new item types in research. And I, I, I don't just, just, that's just what I can remember this second. Uh, so we need a lot more uh, 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 training, not just at ATP, although that's what we're here to talk about now. Uh, National Council of Measurement and Education, the International Test Commission does some nice workshops. AERA has a raft of great workshops. APA, most of us probably don't go to APA, but they do a lot of workshops. And I think we need to expand the training. One, because a lot of us didn't come into this as graduate students and learn measurement. We ended up doing stuff as a content person, and the next thing we know, we're, we're working on tests. So, we got to catch up, and I, I think groups like ATP has been invaluable in providing training. And maybe we can have, Mary, uh, some, some introductory ones and some maybe more advanced ones and uh, really expand the training. But if, if you don't get more training, um, it's not going to, uh, it's not going to, uh, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to make happen what needs to happen in our field. I wrote, as a professor, I'm happy to see full employment for psychometricians. I mean, it's sort of my business. I train people, and I hope they get a job. Um, but I want to say something else. But credentialing exams need to be better. And this means much more focus on timely research and validation initiatives. That's, if anything, is a new point. And I was told that, Craig, that, that a lot of the, that was kind of the message that, that was being represented here. And finally, don't stop uh, thinking about tomorrow. Uh, you want to talk, you can write. Um, Craig's more busy than I am, so uh, you, can, you, can write, uh, you can write me and we'll send you the presentation. There's a lot of slides. Uh, I think our... Uh, No, no, we scored it.
such an insightful presentation. Thank, Thank you. you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.